Hello, everybody. I am here with Midi, and this is my birthday present. So I, my birthday was two days ago, and when Midi and I spoke a month ago, she said, there's, or something came up in the, in the end of our conversation about Astrid Sedna, and she wanted to give me this, this birthday present of understanding what Sedna is. And I have been studying astrology for a year and a half, and still, we were just speaking about it before, I haven't, I haven't gone into what the asteroids are. And I actually didn't even know I could look at my charts with the asteroids in there and understand that there are themes in my life that are so fundamental that actually also can be interpreted through Sedna. So today we're going to speak about Sedna, we're going to speak about asteroids, we're going to start to pull a little bit in those mysteries that are there and how they can play in in our lives and the mythology and the astrology and the gene keys connected and weaving those things. So thank you Miri for being here, thank you for the birthday present and I'm so happy we're live again. <laughs> <laughs> well what a lovely um chance it was to to give you a birthday present that I didn't know I was going to give you until we talked um, when we were exploring Jinky 42 together mm -hmm. um, that, that, and, and suddenly right at the end of the conversation you asked me well is there anything else you'd like to say and to my astonishment I heard myself saying um, yes let's talk about Sedna next time we meet and I thought, what, what's she doing here? <laughs> because actually, um, to that point, I was aware of Sedna. I knew, that, in fact, the, the reason I'd been particularly thinking of her was that she occupies um, a place in my own Jinkies profile of both in the, um, well, I was actually going to speak human design words, both in my personality profile and my design profile. Uh, um, she's in 42 um, so it wasn't really a surprise and yet I I've the gift to me of creating a birthday present for you was that I've spent much more time focusing on her in the last um, week or two and learned a great deal which uh, is a is a precious thing for me and really come to understand even more why I think she's one of the most important asteroids of our time to focus on uh, mm -hmm. right now. Um, even to say actually that she's one of the most important in a sense denies the, the value to me of the asteroids mm -hmm. because um, where they differ so much from the major planets is that there are many, 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 many more of them. Mm -hmm. And they tend to, not, not entirely, but they tend to occupy the further reaches of our solar system. Mm -hmm. And that means that they are, that it, it, to, to study the asteroids, I think, um, both in terms of their content and their process, um, requires us to open up to a much more diffuse feminine way of uh, a, a diffuse focus if it's possible <laughs> to have something <laughs> that's a diffuse focus but we have to hold them lightly and look for the look for the patterns and the recurrent patterns so um, so I had great fun making you a video of Sedna and I believe you're going to post it somewhere that people can uh, take a look at it afterwards. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, for me, when you sent it to me yesterday, I was like, but this is, this is what I thought we we're going to speak about. And now we have this and we're going to have more, you know, <laughs> abundance. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's just uh, dip in. I, uh, I'll probably dip in in a much lighter way than, than in the video. And the video is there wherever it's going to be posted, um, it can be there for sort of reinforcement after the event. But um, there, are, there are two ways in. Do you feel like starting out in the far reaches of the universe or would you like to start um, here on planet Earth and up in the Arctic Circle? Well, I feel like I want to a little bit understand why she's important and I know she was discovered if I understood it right she was discovered in Jinky 2 when the sun was in Jinky 2 right 0.6 
mm -hmm. there's almost something because you said about this could be a feminine way kind of the outer reaches so it's almost like if she would be like the role model or whatever for this she would have that message already to say i'm the feminine i'm the complete yin i'm i'm the i'm can be far out but i'm still embracing the solar system or something so i i want to understand a little bit who she is and that could start from the earth or or from the outer, but just see what, what is she what is she role modeling? What is she telling us? That's what I'm interested right. in. Right. Well, let's start with her story then. Mm -hmm. um, and then think about what we can glean from her story. She might be here to tell us. And um, she she is a real break from tradition, first mm -hmm. of all. Uh, in terms of an association with asteroids and with asteroid naming because she is the first asteroid to have been named that was not named from one of the Greek or the Roman myths. Um, and that I think is uh, the importance of that is almost um, beyond overstating because so much of our world, our, our, certainly our Western world, has been structured for um, several millennia through the kind of legacy of Greek and Roman thinking, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly the kind of classical way of viewing the world, which is an essential um, um, foundation stone of patriarchy. Uh, and what Sedna does is that she takes us back to and beyond um, an indigenous culture because she is the sea goddess, the ocean goddess of the Inuit people and indeed of the, the people from ranging from Siberia right through to Greenland, a large swathe of the Arctic Circle. I don't know. I don't know enough about um, the myths and legends of the people at the north of your native country, Sweden, to know if there's any trace. And I, in fact, I, I started to begin to look for that mm -hmm. and couldn't find anything amongst. Do they call it, are they called the Sami people? Um, in Sweden. Yeah, I know in Swedish it's called Samer, but I don't know what it's called in <laughs> English. How do you say it? Samer. Samet. Okay, well, you know, it's possible that she exists there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and if anybody does know who's, um, who's listening in or listens in and watches at any time after this and does know, then it would be wonderful to, to be told. But certainly Sedna, um, as a creation story, exists for many, many of the people the indigenous people who inhabited the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And I loved the fact, when I went into it, I loved the fact that uh, not only is she important in your chart, but she's also important of the, in the chart of um, somebody who's become very, very well known, one of your younger compatriots, Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, it occurred to me, oh, well, perhaps that's why I said no popped up during uh, our conversation before because you know she's wanting to make her claim on Bella because after all Bella comes from a country or at least in part from a country that uh, has a piece of the Arctic Circle in its geography. Mm -hmm. So what does Sedna's story tell us? Um, she in, she, there, there are many versions and there are earlier versions which connect to her but um, I tend to start the, the clock of her story around the time that she has a very frustrated father because he hasn't succeeded in persuading his daughter to marry any of the, the suitors that have come forth um, to offer themselves to her as a husband. And finally, a um, mysterious hunter comes into their village uh, showing all the sign of being a very wealthy um, hunter. He's got very rich furs. He's so covered in rich furs that you can't actually see him. Um, and this looks like a good guy. Um, he no doubt uh, sweet talks the father. 
and father's ready to hand off this difficult daughter to <laughs> anyone who will take her. <laughs> and so the, the hunter takes um, Sedna off to his home and when he gets to his home he reveals that she hasn't married a man at all, she's um, been put into marriage with a, a seabird, a fulmar. And living in a, a nest of a fulmar is not a particularly comfortable place <laughs> for a, a young Inuit woman. Uh, she gets very bored with the very limited diet of fish that he can catch for her. And she finds the, the nest altogether itchy and twiggy and very uncomfortable. Uh, so she's pretty pleased when father comes to visit and realizes that it, this isn't at all what he intended for his daughter and agrees to uh, rescue her, take her back home. But um, unfortunately, the husband has other ideas and he and his flock of birds chase their boat. Um, they swoop down and attack the boat. The boat capsizes. Uh, Sedna and her dad are in the water, her dad climbs back in and Sedna clings on to the side uh, trying to get back in herself and at this point father uh, decides he'd rather save himself than his daughter and cuts her fingers and hands off and Sedna drowns and she drops to the bottom of the sea and in other, any other circumstance that would be the end of a very sad tale um, but as with so many of the creation myths this is also a myth of death and rebirth mm -hmm. and the fingers and the hands of Sedna transform into all the creatures of the sea and Sedna herself becomes the the sea goddess at the bottom of the ocean. She becomes the mother goddess, if you like, the great mother of the Inuit um, and other indigenous people of the Arctic. And each year, um, the shaman traditionally of the Inuit tribes would dive to the bottom of the sea. Um, their task was to comb Sedna's hair to appease her anger, her wrath at uh, what people had done to her, what particularly father uh, and husband had done to her. And then um, they would make ritual to Sedna. And as long as the taboos of the tribe had not been transgressed, then she would assure them of a plentiful harvest. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the background story, and you can already see some themes emerging. Yeah. Um, and themes that uh, are interesting to explore in an individual birth chart, but also in a, a collective chart um, in terms of what do they reveal about the, the story of our world. Um, and those themes of betrayal, um, the theme of abuser and abuse, the, the, the bullying, the conflict inherent in that story and how it can be transformed into nourishment for a whole tribe of people mm. um, is, is certainly very central to the myth. And also what uh, particularly struck me as it always strikes me when I read and um, become aware of indigenous stories, the um, traditional connection between species, you know, there's another earlier version of the story where Sedna actually marries a dog, which to the Greeks and Romans and since would sound terrible, awful. A, a deep taboo in and of itself. Um, but the notion that we actually are just one species among many mm. um, and that it's up to us to uh, find our relationship and interconnection with the different species and 
to find our relationship with the environment so that we are respectful custodians of the environment. Um, that is something that I, I see very deeply in, in the Sedna story. Mm. So, and what, um, what doesn't happen in the Sedna story, which sometimes does happen in the Greek and Roman myths, is there is no actual um, notion of Sedna seeking revenge. Mm -hmm. um, she's been wronged, she's been abused, she's been betrayed. She's actually, thanks to her father's actions, she's, she's been killed. And yet there is no aftermath in terms of, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my revenge on these um, beastly people. <laughs> so, yeah. So what resonates for you in that story? Well, the very last thing you said, if, it, if, if the two points, Jinky 2.6 or Gate 2.6, if that's where, if that's her activation and it's only the yin line, there's no revenge. There's just receiving. There are six gene lines. So there, there is that embrace. And maybe there, maybe there is anger. Maybe we need to comb her hair. But it's almost, anyway, there is no action of revenge. And that's, that would be for me connected to the gene keys and, and that activation. Well, I've got somewhere, I've got a slide which actually captures some of the quotes from Richard's um, writings on Jinky 2. And I wonder where, shall we try and pull it up? Yeah, um, yeah I would love that. Uh, let me see if I can do it easily. Um, here we are. Okay, let's go up um, what's happening in the world. Said no in Gene Q6. Let's make this big. Does that work on the yeah, screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, that's for you. Perfect. okay. So, uh, you know, I knew that Sedna had been discovered in, in Gene Key um, 2 when she was sitting in Gene Key 2. And it made total sense to me that she would be at the six line because, she, you know, it would be this systemic, this overview, the ability of the six line to see the whole and to become a teacher um, for the whole. Yeah. And also to be, um, to, to have to find a way to invite themselves in. You know, I feel that Sedna invited herself into our story. Um, and I just love that. Um, but when I went to uh, reread Jinky 2, I was actually blown away. I mean, I only picked up six or seven quotes out of the, the Gene Keys book on the second Gene Key. Uh, but it was as though Richard was writing the story of Sedna, I felt. I mean, if we, if we look at these, he speaks of it as the most archetypically feminine of all the 64 Gene Keys. The binding force for all seemingly disparate cells and events within existence. This notion of our, our being connected, we're, we're, we are in direct connection with all the species. We've just forgotten yeah. that, that we are. Um, the shadow of dislocation, this blew me away as well. The shadow of dislocation implies both the sense of being lost in time and space. If we talk in a minute, I don't know about um, Sedna the asteroid, mm -hmm. we'll see how relevant that sense of lost in time and space is to her position in the solar system mm -hmm. and of dismemberment. I mean, <laughs> the actual word dismemberment and the story of, of, of a, a young woman whose fingers and hands are actually cut off, a dismemberment is directly in the myth. Um, and as Richard so wisely states, most Aboriginal cultures don't live with a sense of separation from life. I mean, that's been my biggest learning from uh, living and working and playing with people from different indigenous cultures around the world, that this, this extraordinary sense of connection with 
um, with life, with everything around you is something that I was very well aware when I, when I came in contact with it first. I, I, came, I really became aware of how dislocated had been the culture that I grew up in and how separate the, 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 the way of the structure of my, my um, childhood society. And I love this quote, Bella. I just so love it. As you come more and more in contact with your unity with all creatures, you also witness an enhancement of your own uniqueness. That's, that is, I feel that's so true. And it's, um, it speaks to the, the deep fear that I've, find people have. I, I spend a lot of time like you um, as a, an organization consultant and it became really clear to me that um, in terms of the client organizations I worked with, uh, it was much easier for people who were moving from codependency to independence uh, to come into their, their sense of their power than it was at the kind of the other level of evolution of independence into interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I've reflected an awful lot on what, what's that about? And I've you know, explored it in myself. And I think there is a really primeval fear that, that if we let go of our independence, we'll somehow be lost as individuals. Mm -hmm. we'll we'll become part of this morass you know the 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 faceless morass of society and we'll we'll lose that sense of being special and and being unique and yet my experience is that the more and more i've allowed myself to ra relax into this sense of being at one with whoever i'm with with the group i'm with the more I do find that the the uniqueness within it, particularly in in where my creativity can come into play for the whole, is that something that you would um, would identify with? Yeah, and what I have felt since since you started to speak about the species and the the interconnection, I've been seeing Gene Key or Gate nineteen all the time, and knowing that what what Ra was saying is that the mutation that is happening is in the 45, 40, uh, 49, 19. So what I, and you are speaking about codependence now, which is the shadow frequency of the 19. So I feel like there is something happening. And before that mutation happens between the 19 in the root center and the 49 in the emotional center, it's almost like the interdependence is veiled. But when that happens, then we realize maybe there is a, a there's a mutation. We don't know what's going to happen. And I don't believe that it is that we're not going to have a connection anymore. I think there's going to be, some, some healing in, the, in the, how the emotional system works so that actually we can come in and, and see not only independence, but also interdependence. That's so interesting because I was listening this morning to uh, Thomas Hubel um, in a, a session about the um, healing of collective trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he has some, some very, very wise things to say. And he perceives the, the, the nervous system is actually a collective phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's like we are little islands of, of the collective phenomenon of this nervous system. Yeah. Yeah, so much. Well, you know, the, the, the last two quotes I have on this particular slide also speak to aspects that I really love about the, the sadness story and the, the notion that this is the cornerstone of all city states. I, I found myself um, in a way that I haven't yet with any other asteroid study, I found myself feeling that this, this could be said of Sedna um, as the, the sort of the cornerstone of all asteroid city-states. There's something about the all-embracingness of her. There's something about the way that she truly embodies 
um, the, the, the feminine, the divine feminine. Um, and in a curious way, she's not making any claims upon us, but she is here all around us. Um, you know, I, I was just blown away by reflecting on the extent of our, our planet, which is made up of ocean, mm -hmm. you know, that, that more than two thirds of our world is made up of ocean. And, and here is this deep feminine energy that is, um, that is here to, to feed and nourish and, and teach and inspire us. And I, I remember seeing a, a movie called The Big Blue. Um, whenever I've seen any kind of uh, underwater, under, you know, underwater movie or series, there was a, used to be a series when I lived in a country where I watched television very much, uh, called Jacques Cousteau. He was an underwater explorer. I don't know, he probably doesn't even exist today, but um, there is something extraordinarily mysterious about the underworld and the teeming life and the variety, the diversity of life that exists on the ocean floor. And those deep, deep areas that, you know, that perhaps we haven't even been into uh, as humanity yet, the deep, deep ocean layers of the world. Um, and if the, the, the deep feminine resides anywhere in the physical space of planet Earth, then I do feel it resides in our, our oceans. I understood um, after putting this video together at a, almost a visceral level um, why I think um, the astrologer who I know who's, who's paid a lot of attention to Sedna, Alan Clay, why he speaks about Sedna as the higher octave of Ceres and Demeter. Um, and because I've been very recently studying the, the Demeter myth, um, I've had this sense of, of falling even more deeply into the arms of the Great Mother as I've gone further and further into my contemplation of, of Sedna. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know how to stop this share. Maybe I just press the escape button. <laughs> See. Yes, then I can stop. <laughs> Wanted to see your face again. Yeah, what I am, what I am, the synchronicity that I see here, I mean, we have been, we were, the sun was in, in, in Jinki too until yesterday and my birthday was on Thursday and what I've been looking at the last months when it comes to the gene, to, to the human design chart is that more and more I'm starting to see the red side, the design side as, as what we can't manipulate with the mind so that that would be the soul, the DNA, the lineage, it really was stable, what we can't, what we can't manipulate with the, with the mind. And then we have the black side lives, work, evolution, and the other planets that are our role in this life and our personality, our mind. So having that in mind, that actually my Chiron on the design side is 2.6. And there is something, there is something here with a mother wound, with a wound, with a wound that is like deeper also than maybe the tasks that I might have in this life, that that lies here in in the outer planets or in the in the planets that we kind of have to. It's it's not supposed to just be there as cards on the table. Like it's only when we go into the mystery, and that's why I, you know, I didn't really know what we we're going to speak about today, but I know it's the mysteries of Sedna because it's it's not supposed. It's supposed to be veiled. The same thing as I believe you could read the Bible, and if you can decipher it, then is it Neville Godwill, for example? If you can decipher it, then it's there for you and it's clear. But it's that's what I feel with the astro. That's what I feel with, with Chiron. That's what I feel with merging the astrology into human design and say, okay, usually we don't look at Chiron, but actually here it is. And then in my chart, I believe, you know, when you look at it, you can see those activations kind of lining up also in the same place. And then it's almost like there must be some, something there. It can't just be 
I mean, <laughs> it, there, there is something that points us to look at that when we dare to go into the mystery. And probably when you dare to go into the mystery um, of the second jinky, you don't ever know if you're going to surface up from that depth of the sea again. <laughs> well, can we actually go to your chart? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in fact, what I'd love to go to is the aspects of your chart. Um, yes. Because I, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by your chart. Um, I'm going to try and go back into the, the same piece, but to a different page. Um, I think it's this one. Because you're linking um, Chiron and Jinky to your son and Sedna. Um, I, I don't know if anyone who may be watching us may be a, an astrologer. Um, but what I know is that the biquintile positions absolutely fascinate me and really, really speak to me. And they were the first thing that I noticed in your chart, because if you look at the, the position of, of Sedna, um, she's about, she's, I think she's somewhere around about 12 or 13 down in the aspects chart. Mm -hmm. Uh, right slap bang in the the middle of um, the page are these biquintile placements. And you're mentioning Chiron. You also have biquintile placements, I noticed, in Chiron. Um, so Sedna and two of her <coughs> conjunct asteroids um, are uh, by quintile Mars, which is a very interesting placement because Mars is the um, is the is the ruler of your moon um, your m moon placement in Scorpio, mm -hmm. and you've got this um, very strong and very beautiful. Actually, if we can we go to the here, we can see more clearly. You've got this very strong um, opposition line between. Sedna and your moon Jupiter. You've got the lovely moon Jupiter conjunct and you've got it in Scorpio, which, which gives you this incredibly charismatic, deep and charismatic, um, quite erotic, uh, very, I mean, anything to do with, um, with, with Scorpio tends to be very erotic, very sexual. And you've got this intense energy, and, and it's, it's just such a beautiful conjunct there. Uh, and it's in your fifth house, so it's where you show yourself to the, to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got this, this strong opposition, but you've got the uh, biquintiles with Mars. And the biquintile is a very mysterious, it's, it's a very magical aspect, I, I feel. Uh, now this is this is midi talking, and uh, there may be plenty of astrologers who will disagree with me. But the biquintile um, um, aspect means that the the planets are 144 degrees apart, mm. and to me, 144 is one of the uh, real, really important numbers because it's the the 12 by 12. Um, and one perspective I have on the 12 by 12 is that once you have, have filled in your 12 by 12 um, space, energetic space, you're actually beyond being pulled back down into entropic energy. Mm. Um, you're out of the pull of negative forces. You will, you'll, you'll be... Um, able always to to hold those lightly in your awareness and not get um, not get drowned by them in fact <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and the biquintile uh, has a very strong association because it the hundred and forty four um, makes up the 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 five points of the the five lines of the pentagram so we 've got the the five numerological energy of the pentagram. And I feel that this plays a, a very, somehow a very big part in your story. 
And so I'm fascinated to know more about you and your Sedna relationships with these other bipintile conjunct. Um, and one's a centaur, a, a Cicleus, and Hephaestus is a, is a very powerful um, asteroid in his own right. Uh, so I'm really interested to explore more about that with you. But also this, this Chiron biquintile, the relationship with um, Saturn, and lo and behold, with Neptune, mm -hmm. the, the, the god of the ocean, god of the oceanic realm. And that is the personality, Chiron. So it's now what we are looking, if people are, if to kind of situate people, this is everything that we're looking at now is astrology. So uh, that comes from the point of birth. So that would be the personality side. So here we don't have that exact, probably over, quite exact conjunction between the design Chiron and, and Sedna. So if we would put in that as well, there would be probably even more aspects that would, could make some sense as well. Yes, I, you know, the, the question often comes up with asteroid study. Do I look at my natal chart or do I look at my um, design chart? And I, I think people have to just follow their own intuition on this. Uh, I th is, your, is Chiron still in 2-6 in your, in your um, personality chart or is it in 2-4? Well, no, the sun is 2-4 in my personality, and I think, actually, that Chiron in my personality is 23-4. So it's not, it's not uh -huh. in the 2, it's right after, right. but three months back in time when my design was, then it was in 2, right. 6. Right. Yeah. And I, I believe that, speaking about me, I believe that what I'm looking at right now in my life is this, is this strong preference for for the collective and for unity and and the the strong pull to always go there even if my hands are cut off by somebody i love basically it's that preference it's the preference for the city but the city can almost be a, it can almost be a place of like of, of not of hiding but it can be the easier place to go to and as the four six profile there is a tendency to go to the transpersonal the collective there's a preference to think that that's even higher than you know the personal and the individual and and what isn't unity so i can see i can see myself looking at my preference to always go to one place and then that makes me think okay if there is that preference then that that's something to look at and what is the personal and what is it in my experience that isn't collective and going back to scorpio and to those planets like even even this form it's almost like i feel like it's an instrument for the collective it's not mine because it's easier for me to go to having this as a sensor for transmitting something and maybe also we have the, looking at the houses in the 11th house it's almost like it is for the masses it's not for me and 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 that can be a beautiful expression but also as a human being where is the balance and i believe there's always this there's opposition taurus and scorpio in my chart there is opposition between venus and mars so it is to have both sides somehow. It's asked of somebody to have those oppositions, born in a full moon as well. There is gonna be the moon opposite the sun. And, and what does it mean to not have a preference to one side of the axis? Well, that's of course, I, I mean, you and I both have um, sun opposition moons. So, so we both lived with um, this energy in our lives for <laughs> all of our lives. And it, it's certainly the case, as far as I've experienced it, that um, it's both a, a blessing and a curse to have a sun opposition moon because there's a kind of objectivity. There is a, it, it's in, in a sense, it's impossible for, um, for, for me, I'll speak for myself and see whether it resonates with you. It is impossible for me to um, submerge myself completely in one side or the other, because I can always see the one, and then I can see the other. And indeed, um, it was when I was really le learning process work and uh, developing my understanding around my default position with conflict mm -hmm. that I became aware that I 
I could always see the other person's point of view. It was one of the reasons conflict was so difficult for me was because it was really difficult for me to stand a hundred percent for my own side in an argument. And I see you nodding in that. Yeah. And so on the one hand, this makes us incredibly fair and objective people, but it can also mean that we will repress that part of ourselves that really, really needs to go into our personal needs mm -hmm. uh, and needs to be able to take our personal position and allow ourselves to be fully, fully subjective yeah. uh, in order to, to feel it, to claim it, to know it, yeah. uh, to be able then to, to, to release the, the, the pain of it or very often. Mm -hmm. um, and I see in your chart, I see again and again this story of conflict between masculine and feminine. Um, I do see a story of betrayal. I do see a story of likely um, difficulties in childhood. I mean, you know, was it your experience that you felt bullied as a child, that you felt victimized ever as a child? No, but my dad and my mom, you know, my mom from the Nordic countries, my dad from the southern, from the spa, from Spain, my mom being uh, having neuro neurological problems from from I was born. She couldn't walk for for two years because the the nerve in her in her ear uh, was destroyed, and we didn't know. They told her she had. They thought she could have MS, but then there were much worse like muscle diseases. So it was this thing of always, always mediating in a way between my parents because my 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 dad wanted to protect me somehow so he didn't want me to know how bad it was but since i was so sensitive and so kind of all seeing an objective i could see the doctors treating me really well because they knew that my mom would never maybe come out of the clinic so it was this and then i had to take my mom's position because she was she was the victim so then it was also this with the masculine the masculine is not there the masculine doesn't care the masculine can't just exist and, and be there it actually even has to lie so that's an an enormous betrayal but then also it felt like that i probably that libra energy that was always kind of also understanding the masculine but i have to take the, the i have to take the side of the feminine because that's the weak so always having to take that side. And then I guess it's also the, the conflict of not being able to even speak about it with my peers because what I kind of had, what I was juggling was so different from other four years old or having to call the ambulance when my dad wouldn't do it because my mom had an anaphylactic shock. But how does a four year old go out and say that to their friends? And also being an only child, it's like, it's that's one point in the immensity of like, a life that it's still kind of too big to handle from the point of view of a four-year-old also speaking about the venus sequence it's not until you're seven and 14 that the emotions are completely there to be able to process emotionally or the intellect is there so somehow it was it was at a, as a too young age that those things had to be balanced from from a point of view of somebody who's actually not supposed to do that wow yeah so at what point in your life did little Bella have a chance to see the light of day and focus on herself rather than the issues presented by parents? I, I think it's now almost because when I, when I moved away, I was in a relationship with somebody who was bipolar for eight years. And then it was almost, it was more oppressing than, than taking care of my mom. And then I did the same thing. I had done the same thing with the school as well when I was a little bit older and I could have cho chosen something different. And then I did it with work. You know, you're saying your career and what we were doing, like you're not living for yourself again. So I feel like, and then I, I did have almost a physical breakdown, maybe six, uh, 2013, 2014. And after that, it's coming to start to reevaluate. But still I wasn't, that the polarity, like you're calling it objectivity, subjectivity. I... I still had a preference for the objectivity because for me somehow that's truth and subjectivity is not truth it's subjective so it's never it's never allowed me to go there because i i didn't value the personal i didn't value that i i valued i thought the truth was subjective but now truth with the second gene key and the alchemy of the body is suddenly like it's suddenly completely showing itself in a new way for me wow 
I find myself looking um, as I listen to you in that. I also find myself looking to your Mercury in the 12th house. Um, and somewhere there's a, there's a piece of this that is signaling to me that it speaks to what you're saying. I, I always experience you, Bella, as a, an incredibly articulate person, um, as, as just so fluid, so fluent. Um, and I see this sense of, on the one hand, um, you have all these amazing gifts of communication and and service to the the collective your your uh, son your car on your sedna and your venus they're, they're all in the 11th house so you're going to be about um service to to the collective um and i and i guess um i guess i there's a part of me that is um, longing for you to uh, receive the, the space, the attention, the, the nurturing, the nurturing of the, the subjective self, of the, the you, the, that little Bella. Mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah you you do have your your mars is in the fourth house and he's in this very really curious position he he ends up being in you know the the opposition generally between the fourth house is to the tenth house and in your case it's sort of because mars just creeps into uh into libra uh your your opposition is actually with um, with Venus in the eleventh house, it's like there's something mysterious about that for me. I don't quite know what that speaks to, but it's as though something has been maybe deflected from from Father. I don't know what I'm saying. Even mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. Something deflected from the 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 fourth to the 10th home, um, public, um, mother, father, deflection, I don't know. I go off into space suddenly, sort of dreaming into this and it's probably not helpful for you in the moment. No, but um, say something more about it. I feel like I need to hear something more to like, for it to click for me. Um, Well, all I can say is, um, and this will sound very subjective, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually go into my subjective experience. Uh, my subjective experience is that the mother in me is really, really wanting to um, support the, the, the opportunity for the that little girl and I probably because at some level I identify with it a great deal because I my story was very different from yours but at the same time I was in a situation where my mother became the child mm -hmm. in the in the triangle of father mother and and child um the, the sort of I'm the mother of in me is really wanting to give you uh i want to give you birthday present upon birthday present i want to give you all the room in the world to just allow your your most selfish wants to come to the surface um your most um outrageous uh personal desires to be able to um see the light of day that's all i can say i think in in response to you at this moment i really want you to have what you want 
(laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, this is something that I have been contemplating when it comes to the gene keys and how deep the transmission is in us, that, that tendency to not, to kind of want to be in the cities or, or that, that preference. And yeah, there is, there is sometimes almost, I feel for me, there is a, there is a veil almost for the, for the personal and it's, it's still for the mind hard to understand how that could be good enough. And, you know, having a complete, we spoke about this last time, having completely open ego, how can it even, how, yeah, how to even have a reference point for worthiness and how to be able to choose the subjective when we, when we can choose unity for it. Like there, there is this, there, there's the mind can't grasp it. So that's where I am starting to feel the body, you know, and that is the feminine, it's double earth. The only way I can know truth is through the bodies, in the body. My, my mind will always prefer the cities, always. And since it's almost like I've lived the cities lifetime after lifetime, like Sedna has always been there in me. And, and it's only through the body that I can come back to my own subjectivity and my own, that's the portal. And to have, like I said, to not only use the body, and it sounds strange too, but it's, it's what comes to me, not only using the body as a sensor, for, for the other, for the collective, not just a meter at, for the temperature, but actually for our own life, aliveness, pleasure, wanting. And that for me is almost like it's been, def- like you were saying the word afflicted, but I feel like that for me has been erased. And maybe that is that opposition because I don't know how to go, I don't know how to go into that. And I don't know why I would have right to this <laughs> actually, because it feels like it is a sensor for the collective that's my feeling and it's there's no logic in that but i guess when i go into it when i start to go into it using that scorpio and going to, with a 28th gene key to the depth of what this dense form is and the densest part of the water and that you know further away ways in the deep in the deep universe somehow that's where i start to smell something and now suddenly yeah, I can I see also the 14, the 144, like you're saying, and I'm I'm seeing seven stinky, my purpose, the 144, 44 stinky, my culture. So there is something with 144 that suddenly is part of, of this, um, of this geometry. Yes, and I feel this 144, if we come back to this by Quintile. I, I have a sense that there's a way in which this can, this can serve you and through serving you, serve the whole, um, which is your, your whole motivation. Um, and, uh, you know, if we look at these, um, these, uh, these, these planetary bodies that are, in, uh, that are conjunct to each other, um, let's just let, let's just explore them and play with them together. Um, you've got uh, you've got these three bicentiles. You've got Sedna, Echiclius, and Hephaestos. Um, do you do you know anything about the the myths associated with them? No. Okay. Well, they're they're quite. Um, they're quite strong characters, actually. Um, and then you've got pretty close by. In fact, I discovered why Admetos is there, and I'll, I'll mention that to you uh, later, so remind me to come back to it. But you've also got, um, quite close by, you've got Toro, and you've got Chaos. Mm-hmm. And these are all very, very strong energies, and they are... They um, Toro is opposing your moon, mm. and chaos is opposing your moon and your Jupiter. <clears throat> so let, let's talk first of all about the the ones in the biquintile. Echiclius was is a centaur, and the centaurs uh, as a as a sort of group of planetary bodies. They, they tend to be seen as mediating the um, very personal 
a strong subjective drive of um, Mars with the much more transpersonal, deeper um, focused energy of Pluto. Mm -hmm. That's the that's one version of, of the place they occupy out in the in the solar system. And Achilles was was one of the centaurs. He was one of the <laughs> the um, violent centaurs that actually got killed at uh, a wedding, a Greek wedding. Um, you know, Chiron is your your um, wounded healer mm -hmm. and the kind of benevolent um, centaur who became the father of, of Asclepius and the, the father of medicine. Um, Achilles was one of the, the band of drunken centaur brothers that um, had too much to drink at a wedding and um, lost all sense of propriety and uh, decided they were going to attack and rape the the women at the at the wedding and he was was one of the ones that get got um got killed um, so he's quite a strong violent energy but he's also got an energy which if tamed can be a very mediating influence um, and different people say say different things about Achilles. Um, generally, he's perceived to be uh, a very masculine and a very strong and um, a quite a heady energy for a for a centaur, actually. Um, but it's as though there's something there which uh, is sort of deep in the in the in the story, which can be explored some more. Um, where is the center energy in 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 Bella, and how can you bring it out in a way that doesn't perpetuate the abusive story of the of the early days of Sedna? Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I have a feeling that because Sedna's nestled up to them in the um in the solar system you know there's 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 work for her to do with them mm -hmm. um so finding ways to to access the acuteless energy without allowing it to to you know trample with its central hooves underfoot everything that Sedna holds dear mm -hmm. um, is perhaps a really interesting thing to explore. And then you've got this amazing um, conjunction with Hephaestus, and he was the uh, different myths they say different things. Some people say that he was the son of Hera and uh, Zeus, and there's another version that I know of where they say actually um, it was a parthenogenic birth. Um, Hera gave birth to, to Hephaestus without um, any need for a male sperm. Um, either way, Hephaestus had a bad time of it with his parents uh, because he got thrown out of, there are again different versions of the myth. Um, some say that uh, Hera found him so horrendously ugly that she threw him out of Olympus. And there are other versions that say that Zeus threw him out in a, a fit of peak, fit of rage, at his son not measuring up. But the other side of Hephaestus is that he is an incredible artist and craftsman. And he created the... Um, the armor for, I think, for the Trojan War, he created beautiful, exquisite armor. So there's an awful lot to explore there. And I'm, I, what I find myself wondering is, what's your relationship to art and craft? Is, does it feature in your life? How does it feature in your life? It comes for me very much through movement and, and music 
um, that's when I, the first time I, I, I broke out a little bit, if you want, from that always kind of taking the other responsibility of the other on my cho shoulders was when I decided I was, I, I wasn't allowed to leave after high school because my dad was very, very Spanish, very, very rigid. But my escape was that I was going to study at, at the university in, in France to then come back and do a special kind of engineering school where you needed to do both French and, and Swedish and, and English. So I got, I got away, but then after six months or eight months when, that, when the first semester was over, then I had an opportunity. That special program I was going to do at the university in Sweden was not open. So I had an opportunity to move to France, to move to Paris, because I was in the south of France. And I did it because I wanted to dance. I wanted to dance all the Latin dances. I wanted to dance salsa, which is not even like the five, you know, the five kind of ballroom dances. It's much more free. And that was, it was back to my Spanish roots, not the things that I've seen with my dad, but what I felt with the flamenco, what I felt with the music, you know, in my childhood, sometimes I was sent away from, from home to my dad's sisters and I was brought up with my cousins and that was a different flavor. So it was kind of seeking those ro roots of, of the exotic, I guess, and of the erotic, like not erotic, but like kind of that, that flam that like that's that feminine. How do you even say that in in English? Like you know how how flamenco sounds. It's like it's this it's suffering, but it's also depth. It's very it's very subjective. So looking for that and and taking the stand like I want to move, I want to dance, I want to be in flow. But then having again the very objective side of me and the very business side. So you know some months in, I actually had. I actually had a, a dance school and a, a, a nightclub that I was running <laughs> and I couldn't even, I, I didn't go back to Sweden and that was kind of the cut with my dad too because I had promised to come back and study. But in, in September I already started a dance school and I had like a lot of things going on. But that was a rebellion. But it, it turned into not be a rebellion of art, which was my heart's longing. It, the, the mind was stronger and it said, well, you can do business with this. But you can have fun if you also make it, you know, if you also make something constructive. So again, that kind of balance of like, oh, I just want to self-express in, in the fifth house. No, actually, you have to, you know, have something so people can come and also do it with you, learn dancing or go come to the nightclub. So it's always that duality that still at that time became more and also being the person who translated the dance classes because we were doing it with with people who didn't speak french so that's the duality again but that was how that's very much how i perceive art it's through the body wow well there's your the, there's your center there's your center or energy also being given a release in that place how yeah. beautiful how beautiful. I, the, the, the words that sit with me from what you've just said are heart's longing. And my heart's longing is for you to be able to realize every aspect of your heart's longing. Yeah. I wanted to explore how Admetos got into the story. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I looked at your chart closely, I thought, hey, what's this asteroid doing here? It's, it's in Capricorn. It's not <laughs> in, in... And yet, so how do I ever, however, how do I ever call up Admetos? I thought, there has to be a reason, apart from the fact that obviously Admetos wanted to have his say and, you know, be spoken about. Um, and I discovered that somehow when I went from um, the serenu.com site, where I looked at all the, the placements close to Sedna, to the astro.com site, where I actually drew up this um, chart, uh, Admetos changed um, location because the Admetos that is uh, conjunct your Sedna and Chaos and Acuclius and Faustus and Toro, and that does actually sit neatly in that, is a Uranian. It's, it's actually, it's not a planet at all. It's not an asteroid at all. It's a hype, what's called a hypothetical. And I, I don't know if you've come across in your astrology studies, if you've come across the Uranians, um, I'm only just beginning to get into them, and I've got into them 
as a result of exploring the Demeter Persephone myth because um, it's a fascinating story to me at least. Um, the Uranians uh, and Uranian astrology were developed by a German uh, and his colleagues uh, in the early 20th century. And they came about initially because he was a soldier uh, on the Eastern Front. Um, and uh, now I wonder if I can say this correctly. My memory of the story of how the Iranian <laughs> astrology came into being was that he uh, was very precise in his calculations and as an astrologer um, and a gunner, uh, he, he was trying to track the, with precision the timing of the Russian barrages of you know, fire. And try as he might, he couldn't get it precise. And finally, he discovered that it was because there were certain points in the sky that were actually throwing him off course, in a sense. And out of the, these studies, right, over the next decade, uh, uh, at the, actually after the end of the war, it was taken further by a group called the Ke Kepler Group. Um, and they identified a number of critical points in the sky that act um, strongly in the um, in, in how they reflect their energy onto what's going on on the planet. And the there are now, as far as I know, there are eight Uranians. And most of them are, are pretty strong. They're all masculine um, and they're pretty strong energy. So there's Zeus and there's Poseidon, the, the Greek god of the sea, um, and Vulcanus, volcano energy. They're very, these very strong energy. And one of them is Admetos. And it was the Admetos uh, Uranian that sits uh, as a conjunct. So he exists as a hypothetical point, but a point of strong energy. And so I started to explore Admetos and discovered that he also has a, a connection with the underworld, which always interests me with this Dem Demeter Persephone connection. Mm -hmm. uh, he it was a king of, I think, Thessaly, somewhere in Greece anyway. Um, who was very much known and loved for his um, justice, for his hospitality, his kindness and his justice. And uh, so much loved that in fact Apollo uh, literally fell in love with him. Apollo was sent to him as a, as a punishment, to, had to spend a year with him uh, when he offended Zeus somehow or other and became his cowherd and loved uh, Admetos so much that he, uh, during the year that he was his cowherd, all the cows that calved had twins. <laughs> and I, I love, I just love the, the synchronous connection with Jinky too, <laughs> because of course the, the, the cow is the totem gift of, of Jinky too, so I kind of immediately made that connection. Um, but the, the, the other interesting aspect of Admetos's story um, is that uh, Apollo, out of his love for Admetos, he decided that uh, he wanted to keep him alive. And the only way he could keep him alive beyond his or preordained date of death, um, which was what the, the, the Greeks you know, deeply believed in and what I think many of us believe in to this day, um, was to do a deal with the fates. So Apollo went to the fates and said, look, I, 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 this guy is a really good guy. I love him deeply and I want him to stay alive. And so the fates said, oh, okay, Apollo, um, well, well, we'll agree to that as long as you'll find another soul 
who will take his place because you know death cannot be denied so death must actually have someone and Admetos was thrilled when he heard this story and he thought that his parents were going to sacrifice them one of them would surely say I've lived a long and good life and of course for my son to stay alive um, I will I'm perfectly happy to die now uh, but not a bit of it both parents wanted to stay alive uh, and the only one who was willing to to die for him was his wife Alcestis who um, Apollo had helped him to woo and win she was a very much loved and very much um, lusted after and Admetos um, gained her as a wife thanks to Apollo's aid and so Alcestis agreed to die and in fact she she represents an interesting story in the underworld because Heracles, Hercules, um, fought with Thanatos for the life of Alcestis. He felt it was so unfair that such a beautiful being should be condemned to death. And obviously the heart of Persephone was, was deeply touched because Alcestis is one of the few people that um, in, in Greek myth was allowed by Persephone to return to the upper world. So to me, there's a really interesting story in this. There's a story of, of parents not being willing to sacrifice for their child, mm -hmm. of parental issues that, are, that take precedence over a child's issues. There's an issue of the feminine being willing to sacrifice for the masculine. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, curious to me, you know, would a, would Alcestis, obviously not, Alcestis as his wife would not have said, uh, oh, okay, Admetos, you can die for me. But he, he was willing to have Alcestis die for him. And there's something about that position of that hypothetical energy in your, um, oppositional setup with the moon that I think is there to explore that it somehow sits deep in your your story mm -hmm. yeah my what I'm wondering too because the nodes so the the, the north node is in is in the first house of it's in the first house with ascendant and in cancer because the first house is in individuality it's kind of the personal and then the south node is in capricorn so i'm wondering also it's like that is what has been lived over and over and over again that kind of that story and it's also the collective because it's it's all transpersonal anyway you know in my profile it's almost like that's what we lived and that's what we lived that capricorn energy and also a little bit looking where we are in the where we have been with saturn and Pluto conjunction it's like we've been in Capricorn and there's been so much Capricorn but now we're going into not only individuality because I feel like the nurture in cancer wants more than individuality wants nurture so that has to be interdependence and that's kind of where that's what their nodal environment is showing uh, and also what we are seeing right now what I feel like we're, we are we came out from that from Capricorn cancer and now we're into a more alive energy in the 10th and the 15th gate and in, in more of a Gemini energy, which kind of maybe go together also with my way of expressing myself <laughs> in, in Mercury somehow. Yeah, well, then when you speak to that, I see the resonance of our own charts of my son in Cancer, you know, this yearning I have to nurture you and nurture you and nurture you. <laughs> and, uh, and I too have a, have a, a, um, Mercury actually my Mercury is just out of the 12th house but is is close to that um, yeah yes I'd met us the, the the Capricorn he, the reason that it, it got um, got mixed up in the in the thing is that there is also an Admetos who is a he's um he's one of the Jupiter Trojans um he's there are, there are two admetos there's the hypothetical uranian mm -hmm. and then there's this capricornian admetos who as you say is in that 61st gene key um and yes this question of is is um 
is this part of the karmic piece that the the parental inheritance that Sedna is here to help you work through and and dissolve I don't yeah. know and I can feel maybe with you what I feel too is that it's almost like there is a healing with the adult and the child somehow you know in it can even be in ourselves because we almost choose chose the adult in ourselves so we maybe betrayed our child so we don't even everything's all genetic we don't even have to go to the actual right parent we can just see it in ourselves too right i love your toro because um he's conjunct your son and uh he's he's the one of the of the group that's um in opposition to the moon that is is conjunct your son and you know the, the uh what Demetri george says about toro is that he is an incredible source of power mm -hmm. um when you can when you can learn to access him um there's a kind of a i think she uses the words aggressive mastery there's a there's a way in which you're at, you actually have the the strength and yet this extreme femininity with with, with which to do it you you have the the strength to really challenge and require um almost require humanity to evolve to transform mm -hmm. um as long as it can be done and and you know it would make sense to me that you had these really difficult experiences as a child because they make you so sensitive to um you know what it's like to to be sort of overwhelmed by the parental story it, it, it makes you sensitive to to not go into the abusive bullying energy yourself it will and you'll, you'll keep that detachment that will always have you holding the position of the other person or the group in, in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I saw today when I was walking outside that Venus work is what I do. You can, like, you can look at it in all kinds of directions, but at the end of the day, even what I'm doing usually with a sacred marriage, when I look at the sign Venus and the sign Saturn, it's like there's it always starts there for me the venus work it's always it kind of starts there and it goes back there <laughs> and and that's that's what it is and that's also why we have those the childhood is always a replay of of whatever it is that that the that the dna is holding so we get a, a possibility to see it again in this lifetime it i guess it has to do with that 33 the 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 retreating between lives and, and the coming back or the 22 it, it's, it's that dance so that's why that's why it, it comes back but we can also look at the asteroids and it's the same story you can look anywhere and it's just, you can look in yourself or with the relationship with the parent and it's always one kind of what we were saying in the beginning once you start to put the cards on the table once you have the courage to go with that jupiter and that moon in the scorpio energy and actually look at the depth then the cards are the same everywhere I'm by myself. Let's see if she comes back. Just typing to me. This is so exciting. <laughs> Let's see if our computer died. I'll stay on for a little bit. Oh, she's back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about computers dying. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Short intermission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you came back. I, <laughs> but, uh, it was kind of a, like a sus suspense. Like, what did I say? I should probably like play it back then and be like, what did I just say? I wanted to be highlighted. <laughs> Well, my memory is you were talking about Venus, but I have no recollection of what you actually said. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was, I guess I was just saying that I feel like my, what I do is Venus work, but now, and this maybe leads us into maybe the last thing we're speaking about, the Pluto that you are saying, and the, the 15 and the 27, because there is something where I, I do Venus work because I have the gene keys, but now I see the Venus work is also often a combination of Pluto as the collective wound, as Chiron, with Chiron as the wounded healer, and also with the core wound as, as we have it in the, in, in the sign Mars, as in the gene keys. Like they are all telling the same story. And if you have the possibility to weave those different timelines together, then suddenly you can, what I see is that I can see the wound even clearer because I see it from, from so many different dimensions. Um, and, and that's exciting. <laughs> Wait, I can't hear you, Midi. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, while I was trying to reconnect, um, I was thinking, what, what haven't we spoken about? That, and there's an awful lot that we haven't begun to speak about. Um, that I really wanted to ask you about. I, I think in particular, I want to explore um, what's your experience of Sedna in Gene Key 27? What does this really mean for you? Because you, you just mentioned it very briefly, the, the, the 27. Um, and and 27 is um it's selfishness to the path of altruism to selflessness is that yeah well i guess there's needless to say uh that i have a very strong connection to my mother because i think that the reason for her survival was that she had a baby because they told her she was going to be in a wheelchair she was going to be blind and deaf and she has the 57.4 in her attraction. My dad has 57.3 in his attraction. And my core wound is the 57.4. So my mom's attraction sphere is my core wound. So that's like, that's of course something. And also I have the 713 in my radiance and purpose and she has it in her life's work in, in evolution. And her pearl is 61 and my SQ is 61. So there is this geometry. And so needless to say that there is a theme what I, so this, the 27, the way I've got to know it is because it's 27, six, again, a six line, it's my mom's core wound. And it's connecting into my design, you know, her, her design Mars is connecting it into my design uh, Pluto. So 50.1 and 27.6. And here, what, my, what I think about suddenly, Richard did this, uh, this web, not webinar, it was a course on the Venus sequence maybe 10 years ago and it was it was taking the lines of the attraction sphere and it was saying the yeah. sexual theme between them and the line one with the line six is it says it's a karmic bond it's it's an all-encompassing you know it's it's like it's untouchable you can't even reach it in the shadow frequency but it's all encompassing and life transcending in the higher frequency so there is something there with my mom's core wound and somehow in this lifetime yeah she's like maybe more she's maybe more directed to look at the personal wound because there's something with her Pluto also position. I can't remember in astrology that she's already worked with. Her Pluto is her personality sun or something. So she's, she's pushed to look at 27.6 and I am pushed to look at 50.1. So it's like, there is, there is something, there's just something there with the story. Like I'm looking at Pluto, which is super outer planet, but it's a first line. So it goes into the foundation for me. She is actually also, she has a similar thing. She has a six line. So it's super far out there, the, the core window separation, but still that's this very, very, very personal thing. Am I self-sacrificing or am I like, am I sick so I can put myself in the center? You know, those, that duality or that, that, that thing in the, in the shadow frequency. And I guess for me, it's also, I can't stand corruption because standing corruption would, would be, that's why I can't stand the personal because subjectivity could be a corruption of the objectivity. 
so this is these are the things that pop up for me when when you speak about the 27. Mm -hmm. do you actually talk jean keys talk with your mother i do and she you know she kind of excuses herself and says oh you always say that i'm this and i speak about the four most most important ones and especially her having the 39 55 i feel like that's why that's the spirit and the the you know so but she's not completely she more she's a five one and she has a 23 43 so she looks at it from a interesting perspective and when i speak about the seven and the 13 of course to be before, you know aquarius and, and all that she she gets it but she does it's that thing she's not studying it herself like we know that the path of contemplation is the way there and she hasn't that is not the path of contemplation that she has chosen all the ways that she she has chosen so many other paths on in in all these years you know mm. it touches me to hear you talking about that um that extraordinary karmic relationship that that you have with her it's very beautiful. And my mother died before uh, I came to Jean Keys. She, she was, um, nonetheless, she was very interested in her later years. She was very interested in a, a lot of the things I explored. And she, was, she became particularly interested in something called Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm always thrilled when I hear of... of um, younger parents and and children who are actually exploring their relationship uh, through these charts because she certainly said if if she had only known about her myers-briggs profile and my myers-briggs profile when i was a child she wouldn't have had half the trouble with me that she felt she had or <laughs> she would have found it so much more easy to to understand me um so it's it's lovely to to hear that you somehow that your wisdom with this is um, is accessible to her is is available to yeah. her and i feel there's been a breakthrough thanks to the how i've been able to explain the emotional the, un, the undefined emotional and the defined emotional being a transpersonal child with sedna and all this with nothing in my emotional center center with two, yeah parents and she I think I wouldn't have been able to articulate how that feels and it wasn't mm -hmm. even like you are just a sensor for all the emotions that are there and you're nothing like it's that I probably that's the again the replay of why it feels like it's a sensor that is just gonna you know try to try to be that Libra diplomat in the middle so I feel like there has been breakthroughs in the ways and this is what I often feel with the jinkies it's a language that I've been, in a way, it's a language that we're using in order to be able to make these things that are so immense, sufficiently graspable. Going, being in the 23 right now, you know, splitting apart what is, you know, what, what, what we can't kind of articulate with words so that the words can come out clean and digestible and as possible to assimilate. So that's what I feel with the transmission is helping us to be, to have that articulation. And the sun is now in the 23. So, you know, that's, that's something that, that is very live. I wondered, um, were, were you part of the, um, the session, either of the sessions with Richard when he presented the rebirth sequence? Yeah, that was on my birthday, so I have only had it sent to me oh, wow. by, by many people asking me to, to explain it. And I'm like, I was offline that day. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, because as you were talking, I was thinking uh, how, how much I would have appreciated having the, the rebirth sequence available to kind of talk with my mother in the latter parts of her her life. She, my father was really ready and uh, my father was just so surrendered um, and had lived an extraordinary life and was ready to go. Um, my mother um, was not so ready to relinquish life and I, I kind of um, feel this is one of the great gifts of Gene Keys that, that Richard and Rodrigo are, are bringing through the potential to really explore that um, both for oneself and with the, the members of one's family and anybody who's um, approaching anywhere near approaching the latter part of their life. 
Yeah, and somehow I feel called to share this because some somehow there there is the synchronicity that I guess that we are speaking about the conflict of the feminine and the masculine. And in my case, ever since I was born, which is almost four decades, um, I've seen the masculine kind of thrive in the world, and I've seen the feminine as weak. And to, and my dad has it's almost like I'm too, I'm almost like the eighth jinky. I'm like that rebellious uh, individual expression to him that he's never going to understand almost. Um, and it's always that that's been kind of how my relationship with my dad and also what I've seen, like I said, the masculine, he's always been very strong, very healthy. And just before we spoke, I was in a, I was walking outside and he never calls me really. He thinks the kids should, should call their parents, you know, and we hadn't spoken for a while and he calls me and he says, well, the two last weeks I have surgery in my, on my head, in my head twice. And they found cancer spots in my head. So the last surgery was for two hours and they had to take away big parts of, of the skin on my head and they take and skin from my leg and replace it on my head, but it's still open. So I, so, and he's, he's, he's sitting by himself and he has two kids that are 13 and 18 that is usually there but with the covid situation he is supposed to be isolated and now when he has and they don't really know they have done now with they have done an mri to see if the lymph nodes are affected and for the first time in my life basically i hear my dad being weak and and that's like it's never happened i haven't seen the, the you know the core masculine in in that sense i haven't seen it weak and it's also this feeling of when i hear how how the fear has the grip you know how the second Jinky and Sedna, she actually trusts it. She actually sees it as, um, as, as an opportunity of actually being able to suddenly not have the masculine kind of here looking down at the feminine. So she sees the possibility of suddenly coming together in vulnerability. And then she discerns how the masculine goes into the immaturity of fear, the core wound of, you know, Mars or however. And it's this realization too that we you know, it's also part of evolution to grow past our parents and almost this feeling again, the parent and the child, when does a child get more, like when does the child, child surpass the parent? When does the child choose openness, expansion and, and love instead of contraction, fear and, and, and those things? And the acceptance of that, because I feel like in my story, there's so much acceptance in that Sedna. It's like, it's, you're bound with your hands and, and you are, and there's, there's almost this, the, the complete acceptance of Sedna. There's nothing I can do. You can love somebody to death, but if they want to go, they're going to go. You can, you can infuse everything, you can embrace everything. But if that other chooses fear, it's like, that's, that's, there's an acceptance in that. And almost also, I feel like the politician in me would have thought before that I have the possibility and I have also the responsibility to infuse that in the other person, whether it would be to go there or, but today there was this acceptance and it was, there's a sadness, there's an acceptance, there is a physical like contraction in my stomach. And then that amazing acceptance of evolution, that what comes after, it's always going to evolve in the 144. And what was there before, it has to be allowed to, to, to choose and to die if that's what it wants. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wise words, my dear. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I imagine that you're, I mean, I'm remembering your um, human design chart. Um, you have a lot of um, gates in the, um, in, your, in your spleen. You've got a defined spleen, haven't you? And I'm, I'm imagining that uh, given the amount of work you've you've already done in your life on yourself that you are very sensitive to fears in other people uh, because those are the fear gates aren't they in in the spleen yes um and oh can, can we actually um uh, i wonder if we can still get up the um the chart am i still a co-host or Pull up the the um, slides on. Now you're called. Oh, okay. Um, let's try. I just wanted to ask you. I remembered a a, a last um, question. Um, I wanted to explore your uh, channel of preservation because your 
um, your sedna actually completes your um, gate of preser your channel of preservation between the um, spleen center and the, the sacral center and that doesn't suddenly make your your centers defined one of the one of the things that asteroids and particularly the more powerful asteroids and especially the ones in strong aspect to your major planetary placements one of the things they can sometimes do is actually bring the undefined centers into some form of definition and give you a kind of color for and, and tone and texture for how you can deal with that lack of definition. Mm. But in your case, your, your sacral and your spleen are already defined. But I wanted to ask you, with all your human design knowledge, which far exceeds mine, what for you it means to um, actually have this um, defined gate of 5027 with your Sedna filling it in so strongly? With some of those other asteroids as well does that make sense to you of, 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 at all and how, yeah, i how guess it? Mm -hmm. it, it takes it from the external to the internal because i guess that i've seen that 27 6 in my mom and i in one sense i've seen it i've seen it worked a lot in the shadow self says of self-sacrifice and or self-centeredness because when you are completely not able to do anything yourself she's my mom can't walk by herself she can't do anything by herself so i have i have that gap in the 27 it's like i don't have anything there and i i guess that i've been how okay i have a bad example bad example i have something that i know that it's not that's not the altruism i want to live that's not the 27 that's not the nurturing i want to live and it almost felt like i only had a i only had that example i didn't want to follow and now suddenly sedna comes in and she says you don't have to look outside yourself it's in you. I'm here. You just have to discover me. And I'm, I'm the motherly embrace. That's who I am. And I'm here. I'm already in you. So stop again. It's like my, with my father, stop looking at COVID and that you're going to die now that you are, have, have not have like as good, a good state in your immune system. No, it's inside. If you can find the nourishment inside of yourself and have the objectivity over whatever is pulling you because it's a sixth sign, then there is, there is no fear. They're, like the fear gates kind of open up. And then, and then I see the circuit, 57, 34, 50, 27. It's like, if you have those together, there's like, it's like life is always renewing itself, but it's based on intuition. It's based, like you say, on listening to. What, what is it? Because your clarity is gonna come from the listening, not from going into the panic and the illusion of 28, 32 together. That can feel like, you know, it's more, pointing me towards that rectangle that creates, that gets created when we add the 27. Oh, that's beautiful to hear. That's very powerful, that 5734 in you, isn't it? The, yeah. The majesty and the clarity. And you have the 57 uh, and Richard has it as his core wound and Rosie Aronson and and what is his name who does he did the seven sacred seal peter tan like there is there is something in the transmission that in the core wound that richard uses as well for the the key that's used for the core wound is the 57 so there is something there and knowing it's my mom's attraction there's just something and you have the where do you have the 57 well i ha i have it i i love the position of my 57 because it's in my pearl it's a four <laughs> line and it's in my pearl and so uh, I've always taken to heart uh, Richard's comment that, you know, you don't have to do any work on your pearl. You just allow it to actually grow itself and eventually. And that, that's, uh, that was a, a really big lesson for me, Bella, to learn to stop straining and trying to get clear, mm -hmm. but just to allow myself to trust that clarity will come when when, when you know, clarity is as clarity does, <laughs> when it's the moment, it will be here. And your, my task is to watch for clarity, but not to try and push the river upstream. Wow. But I, I don't have that um, strong 34. So, you know, I don't have the, the impulse with it. Um, and in fact, my, my spleen is undefined. I do have, um, as you say, the 
57. I also have the 32 in my spleen. Um, yeah. And that's and in your activation sequence. That one is your is it your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's my it, it's my purpose, and it's also in my culture. It's also it's a, it's a four line in my purpose, and it's a two line in my culture. And I was thinking when you and I, I laughed at you, you and me when we were sort of dancing to find how are we going to do this session together? Because we were both kind of seeing the other person's point of view when we were, you know, going from one to the other. And rather than one of us saying, let's do it this way. It was, well, what would you like? What, what, what would you, you know, how does it look from your point of view? But um, what I did notice was that I have this, had this strong sense of one of the reasons I love this kind of medium um, is the intimacy, the two-line intimacy of the the one-to-one -one relationship, and I notice more and more that, and um, looking back through my life at the kind of um, the 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 moments in my life when I feel I've been really fulfilling my service to the whole, um, have been when I've been in successful partnership. So. Um, yeah, I love being in partnership with you. Yeah, and you know, I am, so I've been looking much more at life cycles lately. I have a lot of people that come to me for the Chiron or second Saturn return. And I've been looking more at my, I'm still in the Saturn return, right? Up, up until some more years. And I am a 2-4. So there, that's a theme for me right now. I'm the cross of penetration. I'm, I'm a 2-4, which makes sense. And also my, my motivation is a color too. It's hope. So I resonate so much with, with a second line and also my Mercury is a second line and, and my, my South node and North node on the inner side. So there is something with that theme, which I feel also is connected to the sacral chakra and, and how, how that relates. And that's, that is the relating, you know, that's kind of on the, on, on some, some energetic sense. So I feel like I feel you from the, from the, from the flow of the of the relating of the mirroring and more and more i see i can see that you were saying also when it comes to seeing the fear in others but the sensitivity of seeing in everybody's life and that's maybe why i call it venus work where was it where were where was it that there were no true mirroring because if we can go back to that point and find those points where there were no true mirroring and kind of make them like sit with that and 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 feel it and like you said like go to the depth of it then also there is the possibility for for that to be invited in and and for me that is such a big part of the of the healing journey because the the only thing we really need as human beings is to be is to be mirrored to learn about ourselves to learn about the other and to create intimacy and there's almost that's kind of if life can flow through that i feel like there is nothing that can't be that can be born from that. That's beautiful. Well, what a rich time we've had again together. Uh, I thank you so on. much. It's a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you want to um, to talk about today? I, mean, we... I really want to thank you, and I want to also to the people who who might still be with us in this marathon. What I feel is. Everything that we did today is not in any book. Like, this is what I feel. There's nothing in a book. Even the, the, the mystical rectangle that we just found between the spleen and the sacral, it's not in a book. And this is what I feel like. This is an invitation. This is a second line invitation, almost. It's like, if you can, if you can flow and take, what, what stands out to you easy when you look in the chart? What comes easily through you when you sp speak with a person? What are the relationships where, where intimacy is there just naturally? And, and to actually to actually start to value those points, I feel, and to have the courage to to lean into it because you're going to go on a, on a ride. There is, and I feel like that's the centrality too of the, of the sacral. It's, it's such a pleasure to be in that energy and maybe even that energy brings us back to the sacral, brings us back to, to the portal of the body where we have the door into something that is a more balanced perspective between the outer and the inner, before, between the collective and the individual hmm. well when it comes to courage um i see you as a role model bella i love to see you out in the 
the world, particularly because I, by disposition, am a hermit crab who's perfectly happy to weevil away in my corner and um, until somebody or something in the community calls me out. Um, I love to see what I, what I feel is um, a great courage in you to put yourself out in the world to be of service to everybody. And I just remember, um, you know, when we talked about, um, well, what is it, do you, your birth, what do you want for your birthday present? Uh, you choose and you say, well, it's got to be for everybody. <laughs> and I, I, I just love that generosity. So thank you for this wonderful time together. Thank you, thank you. And thanks to anybody who has listened and presents the, the field and may listen to to any recording mm. where you, you said you were going to put the the video up where will i be able to find it so i i feel like i want i feel i think i maybe will both on i want to put it both on youtube probably but i'm going to put them for sure on the unlock your design page because that's where we went live so it's going to be together there somehow and um yeah, that's what I know for right now. And then I, we would probably share it in the groups because I feel like, especially the Voyagers group last time, I was so touched by, by the interaction of people who were, who were tapping in and, and adding to our conversation. So I, I know that even if this was supposed to marathon, you know, it's almost like I feel like when you have a book and you kind of, you know, you just like open it somewhere. It's almost like, you know, take this video and put the marker somewhere on the two hour long thing. And that's going to be for you. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, yes, well, uh, no sprints for me, always marathons. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I, I didn't, uh, like, you know, we didn't have the 42 we spoke about last time. About this, we didn't have, we were detached to kind of what was going to happen. And that's when the biggest celebration can happen. And also when we, I feel like we got, went kind of through also rebirth and death and darkness and light, you know, it's, it's not we, we went into things that are that are quite deep in in some sense and thank you for taking me there and for allowing me to to share that well <laughs> till the next time my dear yeah, <laughs> whatever that birthday, be. whatever can happen then <laughs> <laughs> who knows that's not so far away now either that's in july mid-july we'll see maybe we'll have a third Maybe we'll make it a trinity of sessions around my birthday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Love, love you loads. Love you loads. Bye, Bella. <laughs>